experimentation in fiction marked the modernist 20th century broadly different characteristics of the of previous movements and styles of art find new combinations and new iterations throughout the modernist and postmodernist era and this gets completely uh, exacerbated when you start factoring in geographical uh, and, and cross-cultural elements where popular uh, elements of one culture start to mix with the imported ideas of others and more traditional cultures let's say start to hear whispers of ideas from somewhere else and begin to incorporate them into their own art and that's where some real significance can be found and one of the more interesting uh, experimenters of this phenomenon is the author known as Prem Chand. His real name was Dan Pat Rai Srivastava. He was born in 1880 and lived until 1936, not a bad life, and uh, he was a remarkable author during that time. He came from a relatively poor family, but he more or less mastered a multitude of languages, including Hindi, Urdu, Persian, English, and Hindustani. He was almost entirely self-educated and, uh, and grew into a very prolific author despite the odds of society. And in that highly stratified caste system society of India that he moved in, this is all the more remarkable. He was primarily a realist in the tradition of figures like Gogol and Balzac and Dickens and, uh, and those sorts of models. His stories tend to be predominantly about the, the downtrodden, the economically limited, uh, the poor peasants who are the salt of the earth. And that's the bulk of his work broadly. And he wrote uh, he wrote more than a dozen novels and, and, and pumped out a lot of short stories and essays. He was very prolific. One of the more interesting ones, one of the more nuanced ones, is one from 1924, relatively late in his career, called The Road to Salvation. And that has a, a, a fairly conventional uh, realist milieu of a small rural relatively uh, minor players on the world cultural scene and it reimagines them in a uh, in, in some sometimes humorous and sometimes quite tragic circumstances now the story itself is not terribly long and it's not uh, and it's fairly easy to follow it's a simple story of uh, vengeance and pride and one-upsmanships and comeuppance and all of that stuff that is very much in the realist mode but the care and details that he drops along the way are really quite telling and suggest a movement into a more modernist and even postmodern style. Now it begins with this theme of pride and situates it amongst these peasant farmers. The pride the peasant takes in seeing his fields flourishing is like the soldiers in his red turban, the coquettes in her jewels, or the doctors in the patients seated before him. Whenever Jinger looked at his cane fields, a sort of intoxication came over him. He had three biggas of land, which would earn him a, an easy 600 rupees. Now, uh, this is a, always look at beginnings and endings. This is a interesting beginning. It begins with that theme of pride very specifically. And it takes this lower caste group of peasant farmers and compares them and Jinger, this one everyman figure, specifically to more higher caste figures, the doctor, the soldier, even the bejeweled coquette, uh, suggesting a kind of flattening. Uh, the distinctions of their hierarchy on a social scale do not matter. They are all joined by this commonality 
of their human pride. Their humanity is linked in this kind of primal sin and or this predisposition towards a primal sin. And that creates a kind of revolutionary start at the very beginning of this story. It also in this moment of pride, as the farmer looks out at all of these things and says, oh, okay, all this is mine, it tells us that he had three biggest of land, which is apparently very little land. He is dirt poor. He has nothing. He's got basically what most people today would consider a small garden. And this is the uh, the estate of greatness that he is uh, glancing out on. So there's already this kind of ironic take on it. And the story gets moving pretty quickly with the introduction of the, uh, the figure Badu, who is driving his sheep and wants to drive them through uh, Jinker's land. And Jinker's afraid that, well, the sheep are going to eat my crops and it's going to be terrible. And th they come to blows, essentially. They come to, uh, they, they're basically about to fight. And the, uh, the sweeping rhetorical style <laughs> that takes over is very conspicuous and it, it echoes epic poetry in its grandeur and 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 pomposity quite frankly which only ironizes further the pettiness of the conflict but Jinger put down his son and grabbing up in his cudgel, he began to whack into the sheep. Not even a washerwoman could have beat his donkey so cruelly. He smashed legs and hacked and while they bleated, Boodoo stood silently watching the destruction of his army. He didn't yell at the sheep and he didn't say anything to Jinger. No, he just watched the show. In just about two minutes, with the prowess of an epic hero, Jinger said, with the pride of victory, now move straight and don't ever think about coming this way again. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's a little, uh, it, it has epics uh, or it has echoes of epic poetry. You can think of the Iliad, perhaps, or in the Indian tradition, maybe the Maharaba. And, and this kind of seriousness of purpose where they are fighting for grand, grand uh, empires. And it's just a tiny plot of scrubland. Uh, also in this, however, you can see a little cruelty. You can see specifically not even a washerwoman would have beat his donkey so cruelly. The, the viciousness that comes out over money essentially these two people are fighting about money the value of their property and that unleashes something really quite brutal in them so that they give up any claim to humanity they become brutes themselves now a little later on after the escalation of this a fire breaks out and uh, and we are not told necessarily, although we have suspicions of uh, who is responsible here, uh, we are not told explicitly at the beginning who set the fire. It, it is just sort of presented as, oh, the fire broke out. But again, the elevated tone uh, ratchets up the, uh, the, the pressure on, on the situation. When he finally reached his field, the fire had assumed dreadful proportions. Jinger began to wail. The villagers were running and ripping up stalks of millet to beat the fire. A terrible battle between man and nature went on for several hours, each side winning in turn. The flames would subside and almost vanish, only to strike back again with redoubled vigor like battle-crazed warriors. Among the men, Badu was the most valiant fighter. With his doty tucked up around his waist, he leapt into the fiery gulfs as though ready to subdue the enemy or die, and he'd emerge after many a narrow escape. In the end, it was the men who triumphed, but the triumph amounted to defeat. <laughs> the, the, the irony is just 
uh, excruciating <laughs> at that point. It is just hysterical. Uh, the, the, the terrible battle between man and nature. Boudou was the most valiant fighter. He's fighting a fire. He is beating a fire with shrub brush. Uh, let's keep things in perspective, perhaps. The battle-crazed warriors are all going at it. This is very martial tone for people putting out a brush fire. Uh, now, it does suggest the intensity of feeling for these people. We are constantly reminded of how silly this fire is because they are beating out uh, the fire from this, you know, the, this tiny plot of shrub brush. But significantly, that's all they have. These people are desperately poor. This is all they have in the world. And when the fire comes, it represents a catastrophe to their entire society. And that is... Uh, significant in its way. It reminds us, oh, wait, we can laugh about the, uh, the high talk of the epic hero, but to those people, it is that epic nature of uh, the rise or fall of a civilization. It is, those are the stakes for these people. So again, we are, as readers, pushed into another corner and said, oh, 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 okay, I, I hadn't really considered that. So we're, we're constantly being shifted around by this text in a very subtle way that uh, is pulling levers of narration that don't generally appear in realist uh, fiction. But then after the fire, there is a chapter break. Uh, these are some very short chapters. And after the, uh, after the chapter break, you, you sense that the emotions have cooled down, perhaps. Uh, the epic rhetoric dissolves and it becomes a, a, the tone of the narration becomes much humbler and uh, suggests a more of a collective perspective of the villagers themselves who have a stake in this conflict between these two figures of Jinger and, and Budu. And the, you can sense the hostility in what they're in, in, in their concern because they are, they seem mad at the world, mad at fate, mad at Jinger for starting it all. And while they say they, or they claim to know that everybody knew who was responsible for the fire and the unspoken uh, uh, concern there would be uh, Budu. They don't say anything. So it, there's almost a fatalist self-punishment in swallowing that and not expressing it. So you can go a couple of different ways with that. It was no secret who had started the fire, but no one dared say anything about it. There was no proof, and what was the point of a case without any evidence? As for Jinger, it had become difficult for him to show himself out of his home. Wherever he went, he had to listen to abuse. People said right to his face, you were the cause of the fire. You ruined us. You were so stuck up. Your feet didn't touch the dirt. You yourself were ruined and it dragged the whole village down with you. If you hadn't fought with Boudou, would all this have happened? Uh, so they are perhaps uh, venting a little at Jinger, who is the primary victim of the fire. It is his field that suffered the, uh, the, the primary damage here. So the, uh, the, the anger is perhaps misplaced, or at least it shows more people, once their prosperity, once their property ha is threatened uh, or destroyed in this case, they turn on one another. And this is another element of this is like, oh, OK, in in more realist, in the more realist tradition, the uh, the the common villagers are more salt of the earth repositories of goodness. The simple, honest folk of realist fiction is a very uh, repeated trope in that line. And here it's just more uncertain. We get the sense that they understand that something is wrong, 
but acting on it or expressing that is coming in fits and starts and is complicated by their human emotions and perhaps limitations which again are kind of a realist trope the uh the the, the fatalistic silence of them in the face of that but the lashing out at uh, at jinger in into his face uh the, they have the financial their own financial interest in the in the situation uh, but they seem unbothered with the ethics of who is actually to blame, who is legally to blame. They mention, well, what's the point of, uh, of if, if there's no proof, what's the point of uh, a case, uh, which is, again, kind of a legalistic frame, and yet they completely shift the blame off to somebody else. There, there is a confusion of what they can do. But interestingly, the story goes and traces the rise and fall of these characters, primarily Jinger and uh, and and Budu, as Budu starts to profit off of the uh, uh, off the situation. Uh, Jinger gets angry and he enacts his own secret revenge. And again, we are not necessarily privy to his direct complicity. We have no direct uh, evidence of his culpability in this. But it is hinted at, and we are led to believe, and we have to, are we falling into the trap of being just like the villagers and being suspicious and having our own uh, assumptions, or are we more elevated than that and we don't know, so all of these things are reflecting back on us and making us very self-conscious in the reading process. But it is after both men have then fallen, after... Uh, Budu falls down. He loses all of the wealth he had, accru he had accrued. He is uh, he is defeated uh, by life and fate, and he is once again desperately poor, just like Jinger. And it takes that humbling of everyone across the board before anything like peace can return for these characters, as that representative everyman. Jinger begins with the simple practice of manual labor. Because the jute mill had closed down, Jinger went to work with a pick and shovel in town where a very large rest home for pilgrims was being built. There were a thousand laborers on the job. Every seventh day, Jinger would take his pay home and after spending the night there, go back the next morning. The simple, almost therapeutic, even... Uh, consecrational value of manual labor, of simple work, of getting up, doing your job, and living your life without excess pride, without excess attachment to the, uh, the cosmetic appearance of success. On the job, of course, Jinger passes, pa uh, crosses paths with Badu, uh, uh, and, and the two of them find a kind of common ground in their new humility. The fire was lit, the flour needed, Jinger cooked the chapatis, Buddha brought the water. They both ate the bread with salt and red pepper, then they filled the bowls of the hookah. They both lay down on the stony ground and smoked. Bodu said, I was the one who set fire to your cane field. Jinger said lightheartedly, I know. After a little while, he said, I tied up the heifer and Harahar fed it something. In the same lighthearted tone, Bodu said, I know. Then the two of them went to sleep. Beginnings and endings. The limitations of these two characters. Frustrated throughout by seeing reality only through their own individual perceptions, only through their own very restricted uh, points of view, all that falls away as they come together at the end. The communion they find is with one another, which makes you reflect on the title, The Road to Salvation which suggests, on its surface at least, 
a divine element in this, the road to salvation. Yes, perhaps the road to salvation, you have to be humble. You have to be humble before, uh, before divinity, and, and, and that is the pathway to heaven. But where is God in this story? Where is divinity in this story? It is, what role does he or that play in any of this? Is the road to salvation only open to those who were broken? And is humility among people the only basis for that communion? Is it God who offers the salvation or is it individual humans who achieve it? They're uncertain, these questions. The uncertainty and little gaps in the text uh, invite all of these speculations, all of these conundrums. Even the absence of any conclusive assertions on the part of the story hints at uh, their kind of unknowability. And that, I would say, is a very modernist take on a very realist story.